Good morning, everyone, and good morning to everyone that's joining us via the technology communications. Uh, Kelly and Karen, I believe I see. Uh, that looks like it, other than who's present. So we will bring call to order the Jackson County Board of Supervisors meeting for Tuesday, June 9, 2020. And we'll start with Clark Slows, our county engineer. Good morning, Clark. Good morning, Clark. Good morning, Clark. Uh, first item on the agenda is the entrance permit. Uh, this would be for uh, David Pomegranate. Uh, for this township, 87 North. Uh, first, for this township, it is section 9, 230 and the amount to be in the address. Uh, 48, 371 at the bridge on the east side of the road. And it does. Uh, uh, meet the site distance requirements for a 30 mile an hour speed zone, which is the speed limit. Recommended for approval. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the residential entrance on 239th Avenue as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. Okay. Okay, the next item is uh, utility permits, underground construction permits. Both for water <laughs> energy. Uh, first one, South Fork Township, section 2373rd Avenue, 37th Street, and 43rd Street. Uh, replace the existing overhead poles with underground cables. Uh, the second one is Union Township, section 194th Street, three, uh, about 494th Street, to install new underground service. Uh, both being recommended. <coughs> I have a motion and a second to approve the under utility underground construction permit as presented to Alliant Energy, one in South Fork Township, one in Union Township. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. Um, next item is the signature of the contracts or uh, the diesel and gas contracts are approved by the fleet. Uh, we're still reviewing the return on the uh, LP. Uh, you need action on the signature. Is that what uh, you're looking yes. for? Yes, I would move that we authorize the chair to sign the contracts to the further down the end. Second. I have a motion and a second to have the chair sign the River Valley Energy uh, Diesel and Gas Contract as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. And then some updates. Uh, last week at the Thunder Bridge at Hunger Bridge Road, uh, we had somebody take out the guardrail. The new one? The new one. Oh, awesome. Uh, I mean, that looks like a whole shooting, you know, a whole shooting match. Uh, and nothing was turned in? Uh, we do have, the, you know, there was a report. We do have the name of the person, the insurance company. And it's looking like uh, we're probably going to have to, we're going to get the contractor off and it's going to be hard to to repair, but we might have to pursue it through their insurance company. It's not the contractors yet because it was, you know, basically accepted on that and was open up to traffic. So, you know, it becomes between the county. So they were the finished with the, with the job, basically. Yeah. And and we already signed off on it, is that uh, correct? Yeah, and, you know, we opened up the traffic, otherwise I think we still wanted to be uh, contractors, maybe we would have to say, you know, traffic. So what kind of dollars are we talking about? Oh, I'd have to look that up because we're probably going to get it at the contract price. It's going to be a little cheaper than, you know, let's say it was next year this time. And, uh, it's going to be thousands of dollars. <clears throat> so was it just a vehicle? Uh, it was just a vehicle, correct? Oh, was awesome. it installed correctly? Oh, yes. Ah. Uh, okay. I'm just wondering why it took so much damage. It's just a car. Well, but if you're coming down the hill, depending on what speed you're going to be running around. It was right, right, right at the Iron Bridge? Right at the Iron Bridge. Yeah. So they're probably lucky they went down the road. Yeah. Um, I thought the roads are long, so we could go on. Yeah, and just a reminder, you know, these speed limits out there, there's nothing greater 
and the two lane road is being greater than 55 mile an hour. Um, so just to remind that, uh, south of Springville, uh, basically we're into the uh, you know handicap ramps and sidewalk installation out there. And, um, basically, you know, the surface work is done out there. So, um, and so, so is there one side of that road that was uh, extended for a walk path or a bike path or something? Uh, south of Springfield? Yeah. No. No, just the sidewalks that were, you know, within originally the they're in town. Yeah. And we didn't go all the way, you know, we didn't have to replace the whole shoot the sidewalk. So, yeah. Okay. But basically, what it was, you know, at the intersection is with PDA requirements for handicap ramps and that nature. So, with them two projects basically finished, correct? Uh, basically, yeah. I mean, they were 21 projects? Uh, they were 2021? They were, how should we say, fiscal 20? 19, 19, 19, 20? 20? Yes. So for this, they were for this until June yet? Uh, correct. Yeah, they were fourth quarter of 2020. Mm -hmm. So we got next year's still could be done this summer. No, they, no. there's nothing on the 21 program that has been marked. Okay. And, and there's, two there's two bridges that are going to be two overlays, two overlays and aren't they all the fourth quarter? Yeah, and there's two bridge projects, the bundle project up by St. Denise and Mill Creek up by Andy Z mm -hmm. that are still probably not going to happen at the Free County until August. Right okay, appreciate it, Clark. Is that, that fifteen thousand at one time? That was after that bridge. Or? Um, that final design. Right. Okay. Right. So, any other questions? That'll do it. Thanks, Clark. I think what I what you have here on the agenda is fine. Okay. Yep. Very good. Thank you, Clark. Lisa? So today I need a motion to approve the minutes of the June 9th, 2020 board proceedings as written by Auditor Smith and authorized publication in the official newspapers. Still moved. A motion and a second to approve the minutes of the June 9th, 2020 board proceedings as written by Auditor Smith and authorized publication in the official newspapers. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. Motion needed to approve and authorize the auditor's office to issue warrants in the publication of the claims listing in the amount of $228,572.69. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to approve the claims in listed amount of $228,572.69 as presented. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. Motion needed to approve the SNK Gas and Food LLC cigarette permit for fiscal year 2021. So moved. Thanks. A motion and a second to approve the SNK Gas and Food <coughs> LLC cigarette permit for fiscal year 2021. All those in favor say aye. Well, is there for any this other discussion on that? You know, I asked Shelly about that. She says that's the only one we have in the county. That's what correct. about uh, Leisure Lake? That's, Do they sell cigarettes? Maybe they don't. This is the only cigarette permit that we have in the county, so they must not sell cigarettes. Yeah, I find that interesting as well. That would give something for you to do this weekend. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me, to be honest. Yeah, I was going to say, go look for... <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. Motion needed to approve and authorize the chair to sign the contract with Cost Advisory Services, Inc., to provide cost allocation services to Jackson County. This is a three-year contract renewal covering fiscal years 2020 through 2022 with the annual fee of $4,125. Motion to approve. Second. Um, I have a motion and a second to approve the cost advisory services, Inc. cost allocation services to Jackson County. Uh, any further discussion? Could you just explain that a little bit, what they do for us, Lisa, or is it? It has to do with trying to get money to get reimbursed from the federal government. And see, last week um, we had you approve what they're doing. Today is the contract to approve. Let them yeah. do it now. So, okay. Yep. 
It's, it's a reimbursement from the federal government. And it is a three-year contract. And it's through well worth the money. 2020 to 2022. Yes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay? Motion carried. Motion needed to approve resolution number 745-06-09-2020 for an interfund appropriations transfer in the sum of $5,000 for fiscal year 2020 from the information technology budget to the data processing budget. Basically, in essence, what this is, is that we've spent a lot of money, as you've talked about for the past several weeks on postage, and Shelley's budget is out of money. So basically, we're going to borrow from Bjorn's budget, the IT budget, to put into Shelley's budget. So we've had all of this expenses for the primary here going out as far as postage. We just need to uh, replenish Shelley's budget now. Is that something we should write down about the FEMA thing for the COVID? Is that part of that extra cost? I, this is not <laughs> COVID because it's primarily all, well, I mean, it could be, I suppose, it depends on which way you look at it. I mean, they sent all of these requests out because of COVID. Yeah. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. It's a lot of money. Well, we can look into it, but yeah. in the meantime, we have to pay our bills, so. Yep. Second. Motion on a second to approve resolution for the Interfund Appropriations Transfer. Uh, resolution number 74506-09-2020 as presented. Uh, any further discussion? Nice of Bjorn to do that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Well, one good thing about it I, I want to add is that you have a heck of a turnout and you did a heck of a job. So uh, we appreciate all that. It did cost us a little more money because of unforeseen circumstances. So. Yep. That's, we so how many actual um, um, mail ballots were returned? Because at one time you said there were 67 percent. They counted. They counted over 3,800. Um, there were just a share, shade over 4,200 absentee ballots, and of that, they counted just a hair over 3,800 return. And so we got a 90 percent return rate. Right so I, I really, honestly, I, I was always thinking we were going to get that and we finally got it. So we did get to the 90 percentile return rate, which is wonderful. So, yep, and we'll talk more about election things when we do the canvas here later on this morning. Is this original? It is not. Okay. Um, Shelly will bring the original over. Okay. And that's all that I have for the board today. Appreciate well, that. At least until after the canvas. Thing. Yep, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We're right on track here. Uh, Luann? Let's see Laurie on, do you? Good morning, Gwen. I had a busy week this week. Uh, two o'clock this afternoon is Operation New Year Executive Committee via Zoom for Jack and Larry. And at four o'clock this afternoon is the Pocota River Watershed Management Authority Executive Committee. We zoom again for Larry. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. on KMAQ's Just Talk is Jack's turn. That might make sure you feel like you don't. I'm going to try to avoid her anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thursday, June 11th at 1 p.m. is a Mississippi Valley Workforce funding meeting by Zoom for Jack. At 5.30 that night is an Operation New View Finance Committee meeting by Zoom for Jack. And at 6.30 is the Operation New View board meeting via Zoom for Jack and Larry. Friday, June 12th, 9 a.m., um, the 7th Judicial Department of Corrections Evaluation Committee is meeting in Davenport for Larry. And then at 10 o'clock, there's a regular board meeting. At noon that day is an Iowa Workforce Office Hours conference call for Jack. Monday, June 15th at 10 a.m. is Voice Authority of Jackson County meeting for Mike. At 3 p.m. on Monday is Regional Governing Board meeting by Zoom for Jack. And at 6 o'clock is a Together with Gold meeting um, for Jack. And they haven't said yet exactly how they're going to do that. Our next regular meeting will be Tuesday, June 16th at 9 a.m. From 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. that night is the Eagle View Behavioral Health Open House in Bedendorf. If you wanted to attend that. And at 5.30 that night is Conservation Board meeting 
in Bellevue, in Spruce Creek Park, I believe. Oh, okay. For Larry. The other bit of news I have today is a fireworks permit, looking for approval of a fireworks permit for the Bellevue Golf Club on the 3rd of July. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the Bellevue Golf Club application for a fireworks permit as presented. Uh, any further discussion? I'm guessing they had people check this out along them houses and down along Smith Ferry there, correct? So it looks like it's in there. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. Just a reminder, if anyone does need a fireworks permit for the 4th of July, you really need to get the request, the application in within the next couple of weeks. Uh, I would say, yeah, not anything after the 23rd. What do we have? Right, we need it. We want two weeks' notice to give notice to people. So, we need it before and the 22nd is the latest, so we need it done. Okay. Anything else for me? We're just rolling right along. Thank you. <laughs> Did anyone see uh, Lori? Is Lori planning? Lori will be Joining us if she has it already. at 9.30, okay. Um, I don't see Mike on either. Let's take a short recess at this time, shall we? Is there any other, well, before we take a recess, is there any other unfinished business or new business or board or commissions that anybody would like to report on? I know your operation news is coming along and, and the workforce development's coming along and and yeah, like I had the workforce development board yesterday and um, uh, and following that we had our <coughs> CEO board meeting at five o'clock uh, six thirty and um, things are falling into place pretty well. Um, Dennis Hooper is chairman of the board and he's he's been chairman of the region sixteen. Um, in the past, and so um, he runs a good meeting, and everything went well. We approved the um, Title I adult and um, uh, dislocated worker uh, contract last night. Um, um, Remind me again, Jack, how many counties are in the Iowa Works? Eight. Zone? Eight? Mm -hmm. And the mental health, there's five yet, correct? Right, mm -hmm. right. Four to five. <laughs> <laughs> On a given day. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> they awarded the contract and it's um, rest, care. Um, I don't, they're from, they're not from Iowa, but they provide services to adult and um, dislocated workers in 35 states. And they said the application was, we had a review committee that reviewed it and um, they were there from the board, not from the CEOs. So they reviewed it and um, they made the recommendation to the board. And then that was presented to our CEOs after the board meeting. And then the youth program will be by um, uh, Southeast Community College. Mm -hmm. You want to give a brief report on how the courthouse opening is going for you, Lisa? It's just a, a question. I, I did have a couple of things that I wanted to bring out. I think that the opening of the courthouse last Tuesday went very well, from what I understand. Um, you know, with it being election day, I was in and out all day. But it was my understanding that it's gone very well. I have gotten some information from the state. I believe that sometime they'll be opening also the court services the clerk of courts and such, and they're working on a plan to get the courtrooms themselves opened up and start getting functional. So what happens is when you come to the east door of the courthouse, what we're requiring you to do is, is leave us, give us your name, which office you're going to, and a phone number to be reached. And the only reason for this is, no, we're not, we don't, we're not snoopy, we don't care, but just in case we would have someone that's positive, at least we have a way of knowing that on this day, you came to the courthouse and we would need to notify you. This is all contact tracing. 
So I know that the first day, last Tuesday, they had 177 people walk through the door. It was a very busy day. And of course, most of that was through the treasurer's office. So every day is a little bit different. Fred's doing a wonderful job. I know we've got some, maybe a little bit of a question mark as far as what happens when he goes to lunch. I guess I've been kind of busy. I haven't had time to talk to the sheriff's office about that, but I know that that's been a question mark. So we've got to figure that out yet as far as, you know, how long do we keep doing this? Um, you know, and what do we do with the lunch hours for Brad? So that's the one thing we need to talk about. The other thing is, is that there's questions now. People do want to come and use our conference room in the basement. Are we, we said in our department head meeting that we were going to leave the basement basically for the extension office and for employees only. Now we've had a, a request to come in and have and start using the meeting room. What's the board's feelings on that? Um, I guess myself, I'm just not quite ready for that. I, I said mean, no, but I I'm just, not here every day to see the hallways and, and such, but uh, I would think that's not quite. Like I said, I said. I no. mean, you're talking like who, like pro educational programs, you mean, or the large Even conference like waste room? authority, if they want to start having their meetings here, yeah. should we allow waste authority to come to I, the courthouse? I guess I don't mind that part of it. We could use the large conference room if you would allow that. I, I guess that's kind of your call yet. We need to really kind of see where we're at and how many organizations want to come in and start using it. I, it was just a phone call. I just, I, I have to say this. We had our last waste authority at the facility and we did it like basically in the, in the shed, mm -hmm. the semi shed. Mm -hmm. And of course we were all separated um, and had masks, most of them had masks, and it was real echoey, and it was uh, terrible to hear. Okay. I mean, it was it was just not a good situation. I mean, I talked to a couple of members afterwards, and they just didn't, didn't hear half of it. You know? Okay. So I would say if it's a county entity like the zoning board or one of those, which that, makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. But outside, I would maybe that. No. Okay. Okay. All right. I have no problem with that. I just. The call just came in right before I came here to the meeting this morning, and I didn't really have time to think about it. And if we were going to put anything in place, but and of course they would all have to come in the east door, of course, also, and, and give their name, name and information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really think that's good info to have anyway. You know, I mean, I know it's going to talk going forward to do that all the time, but yeah, that's that's just good info to have at this time. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree, and I'm okay with it. So the only other question I had, Jack, do you know where we're at? Was there any discussion with between KCAP and CSI or whoever that is down there as far as any improvements to be done at the Head Start building? Well, we had a letter um, uh, from Jane asking about the square footage. Floor that needed to be floor that needed to be replaced. Okay. Um, that's all I know that we've gotten. Right. Okay. So did Marty respond back to that? Not that I know of. If he did, he didn't, he didn't copy me on Well, that. you need to check with him and see. Did we have a bid on that? Huh? Did we have a bid on that? Well, I think we were still up in the air a little bit because we were under the assumption now at that time, I think we could go over that floor. Now, well, is that... We don't want to be the one paying for it. It's really what well, we're, we're waiting trying for to, is to see else. if they will fund it. And then what they want to know is yes. what the size is and what it's going to cost yes. to do it. So, in response to you, Larry, yes, we did get a bid. Um, and that square footage should be on that bid. Yeah. So, I would hope that Marty has gotten back to me. Luanic, I guess if you can follow up with him. But so that's the main thing. You know, with school being closed, let's get this project mm -hmm. done. Well, that's what I told her, yeah. and that's probably, I mean, she might ask us about it today. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I we just wanted to meeting this keep afternoon. moving forward on that. Because it wasn't one of the contractors or one of the people that looked at it said you could go legally go over that without taking that uh, tile asbestos up or what? See, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I know that the company that was currently running it, they were very specific with what they wanted. They didn't want us to do this and this and this. Okay. Um, I don't know where that's at right now. I just was more concerned about it's empty and the funding. Yeah. So, yeah, they know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have told them it's yeah. empty and we'd like to do it before school starts. And yes. 
and we want you to help pay for it. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And I did, just as a last note, it is in next year's budget for Marty to be looking for a van. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually in the process. I would really like him to look for a van so we can use it. I have to say that sometimes <laughs> it is about us. Um, so I have directed Marty to start looking if that's okay. 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 No problem. So I've gotten a couple of calls, but one specifically on uh, Blackhawk for conservation. The guy went out there to go horseback riding, and the gate slot has, hasn't been mowed. And we have certain areas that have not been mowed. And the conversation went from being, well, when are you going to get it done? And I'm like, so would you have time to do that <laughs> for volunteering? He says, you know, I would do that if you wanted me to. But I wanted to run it by. Insurance. Sarah, yeah, and, and see how, I mean, we have a lot of volunteers doing a lot of work every place else. I'm just wondering, and this is, he's part of a, cause Bill Hurt and some of his part of the Saddle Club. And mm -hmm. I think they have insurance. Just, yeah. Well, vendor, it would be a vendor type insurance or volunteer. Yeah, I would check with Chris and see what you're going to require. I'm sure it's minimal, whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, we've had this we conversation. Yeah, we had this conversation with uh, Nathan last week about. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, we were by the, the welcome center. Oh my God, we should have mailed it. Oh my God, we are done. I know it was mowed, but it absolutely it looks terrible. terrible. And he's, oh. you know, and that's kind of a transition thing for him. Oh. We had an extended conversation. He said, uh, There's things I haven't got to, you know, and, and things are operating under a little different order, place of order, and, and da da da. So we, had to give him some credit for that, but he's got people running, and and of course they hired a new park attendant, and basically that park attendant is in training riding with another park attendant. So you're basically down one member. Yeah. Well, we just oh, need yeah. to figure that out. Here again, we want to talk about maybe a volunteer. If that's mm -hmm. we need to figure something out. I Community mean, service hours, whatever something. it may be, you know. Yeah. Is you know, there is there a shed down there that we can have a more in there? South Sibilla? Yeah. I guess I don't know what's down in South Sibilla. Or not South Sibilla. I mean, at the Welcome Center? At the Welcome Center. Just a bit one building, ain't there? Is there something? Yeah, there like Maybe there is. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's something I thought about. If we could, I mean, just a, not a real expensive more. Just yeah. To, and Absolutely. just have it there that a volunteer could use so they wouldn't have to bring their own equipment. Yeah. I, I almost that, loaded mine on the trailer. I would that with a push mower, though. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much area is down there, but I almost loaded I told you, I took pictures. See, I was down there last Tuesday. And so I took pictures and I thought, you know what? This is not right. We need to we need to do something about this. So if we call the horse people, maybe they could bail it and pay for their horses. <laughs> then we almost have to let it get it too long before they can do that. I, yeah. Well, what was laying on the ground they think they could bail? You gotta take a good bagger. <laughs> Well, we're going to look into some of them situations. I know Nathan was also going to look for a volunteer in the Sibula area that would go out there and just and, and mow it. So hopefully we can come up with some solutions to that. There's people that are willing to help and volunteer. So. And I'll run it by Chris to make sure it falls yeah. into some place that yep. works. Yep. Okay. I see Lynn has joined us. Is Lori? Yeah, Lori is on. Yes, I am. So, Lori, are you there? Yes, I am. Well, I can't see you, but I can hear you. I'm I'm having some video issues. I'm I'm still trying to work it out. So. Okay, now let me see here. Once you're really quiet too. Okay, try that again. So we're here to discuss the. We have Lori Elam here with us, our CEO from the Eastern Iowa MHDS. Um, office and Lynn Bobes, our County Disability Service Director, uh, to discuss and possible action on an Eastern Iowa 28E agreement with regional and a regional update. Who would like to start? Lynn or Lori? 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 <laughs> You're right. on I can do that. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. I don't know what are you getting any rain up there yet no we're not are you yeah yeah just some light rain but sounds like it's going to get 
much heavier as the day goes. So well, it sounds like it might go a little west of us. So you just keep it down there. It's for long. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'll I'll try. So, um, so I'm here today to um, talk about our amended 28E agreement. The 28E had to be amended to add in the behavioral health services for children and all that goes with that um, from uh, legislation. And this is the same document that all of you would have reviewed when we had the five county all board supervisor meeting back in May. So what I'm gonna do is just highlight some of the changes. Um, I welcome any questions. Um, we can have some discussion and then we'll go from there. So um, the uh, first page under purpose and goals is where we state that the 28E um, creates the region and we have to provide mental health and disability services for adults and then also the behavioral health services for children. So that segment is new. When you turn the page and look at governance, there's lots of changes here. Um, under 4.0a, this has been a uh, discussion several times at various meetings, but um, the governing board decided that um, they needed to put in that uh, the supervisors you know, appoint a director from each county, but they can also designate a alternate who would fill in um, in the event of an absence. So um, that was very important for a couple of our counties. And so they're very happy to see that um, added in. It's not a unique decision. Does that alternate have to be another supervisor? No. Yeah. yeah. So okay. then um, letters B through F on page three are the um, individuals from our advisory committees who will be serving on the governing board. So we're gonna be adding three new members to the governing board. So B and C are adults. We have an individual um, an adult person who is utilizing services or is actively involved relative of someone using services. And then B is the adult service provider. So right now, Lynn Hilgendorf fills one of those spots and Nancy Nauman fills one of those spots. Then we have D, E, and F, these are representatives that will be coming from our Children's Advisory Committee. So we have a children's behavioral health provider. We have someone representing the education system. And then we have a parent of a child who is utilizing services. So of these five people, we still have two that have no voting rights. And those are the service providers the adult service provider and the children's service provider are going to be the non, uh, the ex officio, no voting rights. Everyone else will have the right to vote. That's gonna take us to our next page, which there was lots of discussion and ideas floated out there, even across the state of Iowa. Um, 4.2 talks about voting procedures of the governing board members. And um, originally, we had submitted uh, the 28E to DHS for review, and they came back and said, you cannot exclude uh, anyone from voting with the exception of the two ex officio. So that meant our parents and the person as an educator um, can have voting rights. We went back and forth on this. Several regions continue to fight this and have taken it to the attorney general's office now. Um, but DHS is saying that 
um, we have we have no right to exclude somebody from voting, but that we could put in and use weighted votes for the supervisors. And the rationale is, you know, the supervisors, you're the elected officials who ultimately are responsible for the taxpayer dollars and how they're used. And, you know, you're the ones who are held accountable for those uh, dollars and service. So, you know, we went back and forth. We finally came to an agreement where we're going to use the weighted vote process and the supervisors will have, their votes will count as three each. And then the other members will have one vote each. Now we could potentially get into a tie. And if we do that, that, off, that really truly means that we need to take the issue back to the governing board, back, back to the table and explore it a little bit more and make sure everybody is aware and we need to talk about pros and cons and come to some sort of resolution. So if we do have that tie, we will go back to the drawing board and try to find some resolution with whatever the issue may be. Any questions so far about the new members or the voting? All right. Uh, do we have the closing? Say that one more time. Okay. Okay. The children's part of it. They choose. They'll choose those participants. Okay. Yeah, we we do have a children's advisory committee meeting on the twenty third. It will be the first meeting of the the committee. We have lots of volunteers to serve on this committee so we have a couple positions that we've doubled up just um, you know because we had such a great interest in serving so I'm really excited about this committee um, sometimes it's hard to get people to volunteer you know when they're working and they're busy and they have their families and everything else going on so um, I'm looking forward to meeting some folks that um, I probably have never worked with before. So it'll be a, a good start for our region. On, okay. on page five, under board officers, uh, we changed the language a little bit here, where at the first meeting of each calendar year, the governing board will select a new chair, vice chair, and secretary to serve for that new calendar year. It used to read that the vice chair rolled up to the chair um, and went that way. And there were some issues early on with that. So when we were revising, um, everybody felt it was better to start fresh every new calendar year. So they'll vote for the new offices and go from there. On page six and seven, we have the adult advisory committee and we have the children's advisory committee. So we have two separate committees. The children's committee has several members on it. Um, not only will the parents of children be on it, but we'll have somebody from the education system, early childhood advocate, child welfare advocate, the uh, service provider, somebody from juvenile court, a pediatrician, child care provider, law enforcement, and then um, a regional governing board member. And I believe Jack had volunteered to uh, serve on the Children's Advisory Committee as he already serves on the Adult Advisory Committee. So um, there'll be some consistency there and he'll have a lot of the history from our region to help guide our children's committee as well. So, on um, yes, go ahead. Looks like you got a good mix of individuals there. Nine yes. members, That's a pretty good sized committee, but yes, it is. Uh, we're still um, still trying to find a pediatrician, uh, and that's a little bit of a struggle, uh, primarily because they're working and they have patients to see. So. Um, we're still looking, 
um, I, you know, we have to talk to our committee and maybe, maybe our committee has to meet later in the day, you know, almost around four or five, if that would work better for the education system, the child care provider, and the pediatrician. So um, that's one of the one of the things on the agenda for our advisory committee is to figure out what is the best time to meet for a majority of those committee members. Also on page seven is the um, method for dispute resolution. And we are currently working on a peer review dispute process. So this is something new that if there is, um, you know, a dispute or a disagreement between governing board, between the CEO and governing board, or with any member county, um, that we can call in some peers and have them review the situation and make a decision. Obviously, if that's unresolved, then we can go to mediation, but um, obviously our, our main goal is to try to avoid mediation because that is expensive. So I'm hoping we never have to use this section, but we will be developing a uh, dispute resolution or a dispute process policy and we'll bring that to the board. On page eight, um, under 5.0, letter B is new. Uh, the governing board members felt it was very important that we have in writing that we will have a all member county board supervisor meeting at least annually and preferably in the second quarter of each fiscal year. And so, um, you know, it, it's good to get everybody together. Our last meeting went very well. Um, given that it was a, I think it was a Zoom or a WebEx, but um, it did go fairly well. I was very impressed because we had a good, good turnout. Uh, let's see here. On um, page 12 under management and expenditure funding, we talk about transfer dollars and what the transfer dollars pay for. They pay for the crisis services and administrative services. And so um, it's very important that we all budget for those dollars and um, that, you know, we, the governing board will give recommendations as to what um, every county should levy and they will have that information when they're working on uh, working on their budgets. And so transfer dollars in the past have created some hard feelings with the five counties, but I think going forward, we've ironed that out um, and we've, we've spelled it out in the 28E, so. <clears throat> Any questions? You still feel that way after yesterday? No. <laughs> Curious. Jack, I will let you share those issues with your board members. So it was a bit of a challenging morning yesterday. I hear that. I have not read the tele or the dem for quite city times, but Larry said it's it's in there, so. And a picture of you there, too, so. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> no, you look good. <laughs> yeah, we made the team before the war. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's too bad. Yeah. So, oh. um, you know, if you have any questions about the uh, 28E, or you know, if you have concerns about any of the sections, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, and I meet with Clinton County next week and Cedar County the following week. Scott County has already seen this and approved 
last week. So um, just making my rounds, touching base with everybody. And like I said, this is the, the same document you saw uh, back in May when we went through this page by page. So. Well, Lori, this is Mike, and I, and I myself, and, and, and I'm sure of Larry too, and, and we, we commend Jack and your whole board there, and you especially, for your work on this. I know it's been a tremendous and stressful ordeal. Um, I think I really do like the idea of the all-member board meeting. I, I, you know, enjoyed listening to it, and, you know, whether you just sit back and listen, I think it's good info just to be a part of. You know, you can read emails and you can try to understand everything, but unless you're sitting in and, and doing hands on, it's a little different game, you know. Yep. So we surely really do appreciate all the hard work that you've put in on this, you know, so don't think it goes unnoticed. Thank you. Yeah. And just a reminder that the Cubs are undefeated yet this year. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and so are the Cardinals. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ms. Lisa, when does this 28E agreement become effective? Today. Um, my my goal is that I will get all five counties to agree, sign off, and then I submit it to the state, to the um, uh, Secretary of State. They file it, and then um, we hope that it becomes effective then July 1. That's my time frame. Lori, I think maybe one of the things Lisa was wondering about is on page 14 on the signature page, there is an effective, a line for the effective date. And I think we're wondering at Jackson County what date we would put in there. Is that your question? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I know that for the Scott County, they dated it the date of their board meeting that they approved it. Um, but you're right, effective. Um, I will check and see what our last one, you know, the original one, if that said 7 1 of 14, or did everybody date it um, according to their board meetings? I had glanced at that, Lori, and I believe people dated it the day their board approved it because this particular okay. signature page is specific to Jackson County. Right. And that they are agreeing to amend it. Okay. I think that was how that was interpreted the last time, if I remember correctly, yeah. looking at the previous yeah. five future pages. So I think if it's okay with you, we'll date it today just to okay. be consistent with what Scott County did in last week as well. Yep. I, I'm fine with that. Yep. And then, you know, when we file it, that's when the whole thing comes together. So, yeah. Sounds good. Oh, okay. Well, we sure appreciate the uh, update and the information that you've put forth there for us. And uh, again, appreciate all the hard work, I guess. Great. We, we can take action, huh? I'm sorry. Please ask one more so I have point. one more question, Lori. Do you also want us to sign the resolution or do we not need to do the resolution? Um, no, all I need is the signature page that's attached with the document. I need the original. So um, just the AE, not the resolution. Right. Okay. okay. Any other questions for Lori? I, I do want to remind everybody um, next week, next Tuesday, is the uh, grand opening and ribbon cutting ceremony for the new hospital that's being built in Bettendorf, Iowa, Eagle View Behavioral Health. Uh, the ribbon cutting ceremony is at 9 a.m. They will be doing tours and um, visiting with folks from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Tuesday. So if there's a, an opportunity to stop down or if you'll be passing through, stop in and take a tour, have some refreshments. Uh, the governor is coming for the uh, ribbon cutting ceremony as well. So um, that's on Tuesday and Wednesday morning, bright and early, they will start accepting patients. So um, very exciting, been a long time coming. So 
great article in the Quad City Times about it. Yes. Yep. Nice article. Mm -hmm. I, I had an opportunity to talk with the reporter and we what we did was we looked back in time of where we were five years ago and what services we had and then with our crisis system and the new hospital coming on board and with telehealth, all of that, we've made substantial improvements in services in our region over the five year period. So it was kind of really cool to pull that all together and talk about the different pieces that have created our system and made things better. Well, it's pretty exciting that they're finally going to open their doors. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah. We appreciate it. I'm going to move that we approve the 2080 e agreement as presented. A second. I have a motion and a second to approve the Eastern Iowa MHDS 28 e agreement as presented. And authorize the chair to sign. And authorize your chair to sign. All those in favor say aye. Okay. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion carried. We are on board, Lori. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. You have a great day and thank you again. Yep. Thank you. You too. Is that something, Jack, that we want to change our meeting time that you wanted to be down for the ribbon cutting? Yeah. We could be down for the ribbon cutting. I remember what time the ribbon cutting is. Nine o'clock, she said. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> so you'd have to do a one o'clock here or something. What's that do for your other meetings? Huh? I've got one. I got conservation in the afternoon, so that it'd still be okay for me. But it'd be till, till five o'clock, you mean, or something? It looks like five thirty. Is your conservation? Maybe we'll have a land check in on that. Is that is that something we have to? If we do, we have to motion or just change the meeting for a certain. Um, we don't really need a motion. Okay. We'll just do it. The chairman has that problem. Yeah. Oh, awesome, Mike. Change me. <laughs> um, Lynn, yes. Did you did you hear anything about how things what what really happened yesterday down in Muscatine? Yes, um, Lori shared a little bit with me. I understand Nathan just had all kinds of questions and concerns and wanted things changed and. Yeah. Um, so yesterday, Lori took the same presentation to Muscatine County, and. Um, Nathan Mather, who was a former member of the governing board, but who also had the opportunity, first of all, through representation with the current Jeff Sorensen member, um, to be aware of the changes that were going on. And then Nathan participated in that meeting for all the supervisors, I believe it was May 22nd. Okay. But he had several questions related to um, just more terminology and a little bit of clarification, but didn't change the substance, not the, certainly not the intent of the document. So it's my understanding Muscatine County uh, decided to table any decision and they will, I think next week, review it again. They will review it again at some point, but um, Lori was advised by the chair of the governing board, Ken Beck from Scott County, to continue to have her meetings as scheduled with the other three counties. Scott's already approved it. She was scheduled today and so she did of course talk to Ken to make sure that he was wanting her to proceed and he did. He felt it was important that she continue on her schedule since the questions that were raised there was an opportunity certainly for Muscatine County board members to raise those questions on a couple of different occasions. And when are we going to Clinton? She said Cedar. Next week. Next week. And then Cedar also. Cedar the following week. Cedar meets on Tuesdays. Um, so two weeks from today, I think she'll be in Cedar. So. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other additions? Thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. Have a great day. Yep, thanks. You too. All right. I got a check here. Is Mike, are you on the line? I don't see him. Well, we're awful close to canvassing. No? I think if nobody's present or whatever, I think we can canvass. I don't think we're 
contingent on time. Okay, time. I don't have the numbers like you have. Where'd you get that? You gave it to me. You gave it back. What <laughs> <laughs> a signature on it? <laughs> Okay, at this time, uh, we are joined again by Lisa, our county auditor, and we are about to canvass the primary election for June 2nd. You know what? It was a good day. Um, oh. A lot of the election day was already done by absentee voting, uh -huh. and uh, overall, Jackson County had a really good turnout as far as uh, voters that voted on election day and those that voted prior to election day through the absentee voting process. Um, really, we had no problems. We got off and running really well on election day. Our, all of our equipment worked and we didn't have any issues and we have computers, there was no issues with that. And we also completed what we call the post-election audit. And that is something that is required by the state of Iowa the Secretary of State's office on Wednesday, they do like a lottery by county as far as they, we have 16 precincts. And so they do a lottery as far as which one of our precincts had to be hand counted. So mm -hmm. Jackson County in our lottery, we were picked to the federal race between Joni Ernst on the Republican side and those five candidates on the Democratic side. Our precinct that we had to hand count was the fifth precinct or that Baldwin, Monmouth, uh, city and township, and then along with Monmouth Township and Brandon Township. So that was what we went through the post election audit that was completed last week, and there were no issues as far as what the absentee board counted by hand versus what the machine tallied. So that just proves that what we accomplished on election day, the machines read exactly what is hand counted. So that's that's a good news. That's there again, it's just another. Another way of saying, you know, our machines work. The other thing that people need to understand is that in the mornings when the machines get up and running, we also have them run out what we call a zeros report. And the election officials see that there are no uh, votes on the machine prior to, you know, someone putting that first ballot in to get the day started. So all of the zeros report we have, we also have then we have end reports at the end of the night. And because of the machinery that we are using right now, all of these write-in votes, and there were plenty, all of these write-in votes, then as that ballot gets put in the scanner, what happens is a picture is taken of that write-in ballot. So if you if you just X the uh, oval, but you didn't write someone's name in, it doesn't matter, it picked that up. If you wrote in, you know, uh, Mickey Mouse, we have a picture of that. So that helps us then also balance back all of those absentee, uh, all of those, excuse me, all of those write-in ballots that we have. So we account for every one of those, those write-in votes also. So just uh, on the, on the, in Jackson County on the Democratic side, uh, overall, Teresa Greenfield uh, did receive the nod. Uh, in Jackson County, Abby Finkenauer, Andy McKean, and Steve Schrader was the winner between the county sheriff, between Brendan Zyman and himself. On the Republican side, Joni Ernst was unopposed. Ashley Henson was, was the person that got the most votes here in Jackson County between her and Tom Hansen. Steve Bradley is unopposed and will go against Andy McKean in the fall. I myself as county auditor, Mike Yu as county board of supervisors, and then the head-to-head -head matchup between Brent Kilberg and Joseph Beach Jr. Brent Kilberg was the winner. One of the things that I think people, and I had to answer this question a lot when I was out on Tuesday is, well, I want to vote for both people. And I don't know if you've heard my spiel, but I, what I explained to you, we do have winners, but yet we don't have winners. What we have here is just like in baseball. Last Tuesday was the playoffs. We have four teams that want to go on to the World Series. And so you got to have the playoffs. You have to support the American League. You have to support the National League. A Democrat or a Republican it is a partisan election and we do allow people that are not registered as a political party to vote but they do have to declare on, on primary day it's the only time that you have to declare your party and then whoever wins the playoffs this primary goes on to the World Series as I say or the November election and basically what that comes out to is then 
the winners of the November election or the World Series then, that's the all-star team. So that's the best way that I can explain this. A lot of people don't understand that what the, what the whole meaning of the primary is, but this is how I can explain it so everybody understands it. So we started with the playoffs. We have no winners, just we have losers. They just get to go on to the next level. So we are required because this is a federal election. I will have you um, sign. We'll, we have a canvas, um, an abstract, and a canvas of all of the votes. There's quite a bit of signatures and such. But I will give you whatever you need to look through. Um, you can see that I also have brought over some of the tally lists and the tally books and such that are given to us from all of the election officials after the polls closed um, on election night. They sign all of that and they certify that these are the returns that came from their machine. Like I said, there's a significant amount of signing with all of this. And then in turn, then we have to forward that on to the Secretary of State's office because there's also a canvas that is done out there with our results and they put all 99 counties together. And that's how they come up with the names in the playoff schedule for who's going to be on the November ballot. So for today, I just need a motion to approve the election results, the canvas. And um, after the meeting here today, I will have you sign all of these, the paperwork necessary to finalize this primary here in Jackson County. Okay. Make a motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the uh, election numbers as presented as a canvas. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried. Thank, Thank you me. very much for your hard work. Yeah. Now and all your. It just sets us up for um, there's some. Pretty contentious legislation that's happening right now in Des Moines, and there's all kinds of emails, and there's some wonderful newspaper articles concerning this. So it will be interesting to see if that legislation gets passed and, or not, and how that's going to affect us in the fall election. So stay tuned, is all I can say. <laughs> one more that's right. Yeah. I see that they did pass some legislation. I didn't get to read the whole bill on the uh, reimbursement for county jails for. Certain individuals. There was a medic, something for yes. medical. I saw. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't yeah. read the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't read that. I was onto something else. All that could yeah. affect us. Yeah. 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 So. Well, all your all your help that you had too, and dedication that they had, and, and people that showed up at the polling places and worked the polling places. It was places. great. Yeah, it really was. It was great. Appreciate yeah. that. No complaints. Yeah, Many thanks to them. Oh, absolutely, and you know, election officials take the brunt of the complaints and such, and they did just a. A fabulous job for us and I can't commend and thank them enough. And we thank the public for getting out and voting. So. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Is we're ready to move on here yet? Mike's not due till 1020. So Is he? So do we want to take a recess? We might as well. Because we don't have John, or we don't have that, might take a little while. We've, we've talked about the other boards and commissions. Any other reports? At this time, we will take a short recess. Good morning. We will reconvene at this time, and we are with uh, Mike Griffin uh, and Bruce Fisher, and they're here to have a present a presentation on. Grow solar. That's right. Did you all get the, the PowerPoint? We did. Yep. All right. Good deal. Well, we just we, we thought that uh, after the last meeting there that you guys wanted to know a little bit more about it and stuff. Uh, we do. Uh, we jumped the gun on one of the slides towards the end. We've already got you down as a sponsor, and hopefully you'll you'll Amen. do that today. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know we decided that yet. <laughs> well, we, we just wanted to make sure sure you guys are in there, so that's just a, a little uh, little incentive for you. Well, you used well, us to you used us to inquire somebody else. Right? <laughs> since that's in there, we'll expect you to put in the solar panels and stuff at the new jail for free. <laughs> you want to fire away with this presentation, or how do you want to do it, Mike? Sure. Yeah, I just uh, something happened, and I'm back to. Not having on camera. Am I still on you guys? Oh, 
Still on. Yep. Okay. Bruce, Bruce is muted. Okay. Muted, but he's on. All right. Well, uh, I've got to bring the PowerPoint up. I saw it down there in the bottom, but uh, this is just who we are, and and uh, you guys know that we've uh, talked to you before about about our. Gosh dang! Come on. There we go. I'm I'm sorry. I'm having a little trouble bringing it up. Uh, I had it in the background there, and then I was on that other call. So, oh, there it is. We've got our copies in front of us. Okay. Well, anyhow, the first one just tells you who who uh, who we are, and uh, God dang it. Bruce, do you have it up? Can you unmute yourself? And... I'm sorry, Mike, I'm uh, having trouble. I... Okay, uh, Bruce, Bruce said he had it, but he's still muted, so. Uh, can you hear there me There you now? go. Okay. Yep. So just a note about Jackson County Energy District, many of you may have already heard about us, but we're a local not-for-profit and we're dedicated to promoting locally owned clean energy um, and part of that is is about energy efficiency part of it is about growing solar wind etc but we do so for two reasons number one we believe it can be a great uh, input to economic development within our community I mean jobs I mean more dollars staying in jackson county but it also has a nice connection with climate stewardship and and, and the environmental cause of doing right uh, by uh, by the land and we have the pleasure of partnering with MREA, the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. So I'm on the next slide now. Uh, MREA has been around since 1990. They're all about promoting renewable energy. They were actually uh, founded at the first energy fair. So they've really been around and, and have a great track record with these solar programs. They've done 34 programs. They exclusively focus on the Midwest, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois being the primary uh, areas that, that they serve. And you can see they've uh, tr had tremendous success in 1,600 installations over the course of 34 programs. And MREA does know Iowa. They've had terrific success in Lynn County, uh, where they have uh, 200 kilowatts and 29 installations uh, across a couple of different uh, uh, years. Johnson County is repeating right now their highly successful installation. And uh, we talked with both Johnson County and Lynn County stakeholders to get a sense for how satisfied they were with uh, uh, the program, and primarily we spoke with county officials, uh, public health being one and, and environmental sustainability being another, and they rated it a five out of five. They said it exceeded their expectations. They couldn't have been more pleased. They thought it was easy, they thought it was effective, and they thought it was uh, great for building their brand within the, uh, the community. Um, there's a note here just about solar power is surging, and uh, we wanna be uh, part of that wave. We can the group by, but let me pause just for a moment because I, I'm going past out of respect for your time. I hope you'll interrupt me at any point with questions or comments. Um, and let me just pause now to offer that opportunity. Does anybody have any questions about MREA or the Energy District or uh, what's happened in some of the other counties in, in Iowa? There are other examples too. They, they uh, I think we're, they're in Waukee right now as well. Well, I think we're good. If you want to keep going. Okay. What is a group buy? A method by which people, participants, are able to uh, get solar at a lower price than what otherwise would be available to them. And that's and because that is why. What's that? What's your, why do we get a lower price rather than dealing direct? Why can you get us a lower price? Because there's a, uh, it's, it's called a power buy. It's, it's about aggregating everybody's interests and having it essentially be one program. Uh, if you just buy one solar array for your, you know, your, uh, your farm or your home or your business, you're not gonna get a quantity discount. If you buy 10 solar arrays, you're gonna get a discount, even if you did it on your own. But just buying one is not. Uh, so they have a scaled model where the more solar we install in Jackson County, 
the less expensive it is. And they start out with a commitment to offer it roughly 10% less than what you would buy as a consumer direct from them. And it's because economy of scale. Okay, so is there a minimum? There is no minimum for that 10%, uh, but then it's tiered. If you get up to 50 kilowatts, I think it's another percent or a half a percent. And, and, and 100 kilowatt, 250 kilowatts. So the, you get more value, a lower cost, and it's usually in the form of a rebate if you've already made the installation when other people are still joining the program. But uh, yeah, you get, you get a rebate and, and uh, everybody wins. The more, the more we put in, the more money we save. And Mike, their, their, their advantage on that is that uh, they'll, they'll send out a request for proposals to all the local solar installers and they'll, they'll give what their base rate is. And then the, the board, uh, the overseeing board on this will pick the installer off of that. But he gets, it's a sole contract. So he gets, he gets the right to everybody that signs up under this deal. So that's, you know, that's the other end. Yep. Hey, Mike, do you know what um, size the solar panels that we're looking at for the Hurstville and Turbid Center are? Or how many kilowatts that is? I can't remember. I'm sorry, Larry. Uh, but, I, yeah, I just asked Larry and he can't remember, so I just, uh, yeah. I, I know I have that data somewhere, um, and so I might be able to find it as we go forward before we're done today. In order to get these, like a group rate or a group package, what's the time frame? This year. The Each calendar year? Yes. If you're an individual participant, you have to have the installation done this year. If you're a business, you have to have the contract signed and the, the installation can be done next year because of the way capital expenses accounted for in businesses is different than people uh, than the individual homeowners. So. You know, most of it will probably be done this year, except businesses can push the install into next year if they'd prefer. And we've got uh, we've got a slide on that number nine. It says kind of where we're at, uh, phase one and the phase two, Mike. Yep. But uh, what Bruce is talking about is the rebate for uh, the federal rebate goes goes down after January one. That's true too. That's true too. Although I was talking about we the like if I buy a solar and I get my installation done in August because I'm one of the first people on board with it, um, I'm only going to get that roughly 10% discount. But then as other people do so or get get their installations going more and more, and we hit those thresholds, then I will get a rebate check directly from the installer. Um, and uh, and that's that's because again we hit that quantity discount threshold. So. There's a couple of rebates going on. Certainly the, uh, the tax incentive for the federal government's a big one. That's 26%, I think, this year, and that will be retired after this year. So there's a great incentive this year to, to get solar because we're gonna lose the, uh, the, a lot of the federal government support and, and the state associated support too, which is tied to that. Um, one of the reasons why, or several of the reasons why these programs work very well is that it's interesting is that customers tend to install solar when they see their neighbors have solar. Um, there's a proximity kind of effect and people create essentially just affinity groups. They talk to their neighbor, hey, how's that working for you? Oh, it's great. So this thing snowballs essentially. We also find that discounts and deadlines, you have to sign up by this particular date, really creates a, a motivation for people to decide that now is the time. Uh, so it's, you know, for a lot of reasons, 2020 is gonna be the year to do it because there's a discount because the federal and state uh, support uh, in terms of the tax incentives will be, be declining. Um, so you know, we wanna use this opportunity to kind of mobilize people and recognize this is the best time to do it. Um, you can see the, the structuring collective action. There's a grassroots program that you know, this is really looking to build it up from the community. Tiered pricing, more participants means lower prices. We talked about that. Um, then you've got the two phases of planning. Uh, two phases of the project. The first one is planning, and we're into that right now, though we're very, very early in the stages, identifying our partners, uh, uh, hopefully recruiting people to serve as uh, members of our advisory committee. We have not begun the process yet of developing the RFP. We will do that with MREA, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. 
nor have we even made an attempt to begin selecting a installer. The advisory committee, along with MREA, will do that at a later date after we've issued the RFP, received those, and then we evaluate them. And what I like is Jackson County, we, we the members of the advisory team are the people responsible for making that selection. MREA guides us, but uh, we establish the criteria that we want to use um, to, to, to grade the RFPs, and ultimately it's our decision. Uh, it's one of the reasons we'd like to have a county supervisor on the advisory team is it helps lend and assure some objectivity. Um, you know, we want to have a variety of stakeholders to kind of keep their eyes on this to make sure we're doing, doing things the right way and, and, and consistent with everybody's interests within our community. Um, we'll develop our outreach sessions, which are these solar power hours, which we're going to run you know, probably 10 to 20 of these over the course of the next four months or so. Um, those outreach sessions will, uh, will be done virtually. We'll have a, the contractor who was selected will be on those sessions. We'll have a, a presenter who's experienced and knowledgeable about this stuff. And then we'll have community members. We may have a session for farms. We may have some sessions for businesses. We'll have some sessions for Baldwin, a session for Springbrook, a session for Bellevue, we hope. So, et cetera, that's, that's the way that's going to go. Um, and through that, we're continuing to promote the process and, and uh, uh, you know, recognize progress that's being made and, and uh, you know, keep, keep this visibly in front of everybody within our community. We'll be reporting results regularly in terms of uh, dollars and energy saved anticipated. And uh, also with regard to uh, the number of installations and kilowatts we're able to take toward the clean, the clean energy approach. Let me pause on that one, see if anybody has any questions before I talk about roles, which will be, I think, quite relevant to, to you, you all. I don't have any questions. Oh, go ahead. I don't either. Go ahead. Okay, so there really are five roles that, that generally speaking will be assumed within the context of the group by. The lead organization would be the Jackson County Energy District and, M and MREA. We partner in leading this effort. It's our hope we'll do virtually all the heavy lifting and make it easy on our promotional partners and on our community partners. Um, the promotional partners, we've identified quite a number of those already. As you can see, we're still reaching out to try to develop quite a number more. Uh, but the promotional partners are really just responsible for helping us put together a solar power hour. Um, so, you know, for example, Friends of Jackson County Conservation, we hope that they're going to be, uh, in fact, I'm on their board and I'm, we're meeting tonight to affirm our, our partnership, um, that, you know, we'll, we'll work with them through their newsletter to get the word out. They have a mailing list that we can use to get the word out. That's the kind of promotional partnership we're looking at in, in some cases. Um, in other cases, it's strictly a matter of being able to use a logo and a stamp of approval and, and uh, recognizing that our partners uh, in uh, communities are, uh, are valuing what we do. Uh, the jurisdictions, cities and counties are, are key, key roles as well because uh, obviously you're responsible for inspections of the solar panels. Um, my expectation would be that, that uh, you know, there might be participants within the county that might even participate in the solar buy, not this year, in future years. Um, and then, of course, the community, the participants, the farmers, the businessmen and women, the, uh, um, the, uh, the homeowners, they're all, they all have stakes in this. And, and what's nice about this is they don't have to negotiate with installers. Uh, they don't have to deal with all the paperwork and all the, the uh, um, intricacies of, of the legal and technological aspects of these proposals. We have experts at MREA that are going to help us do that. And then, of course, the contract that, is select, that we select is a, is a crucial member of, of our of our team and he will be present at all of those solar power hours uh you know to answer any questions what they'll do is they'll tell him about about the program and stuff and then then he'll set up uh to go out to the on-site on any area and then that contract will be between the installer and the participant so um how do you survive? How do you get paid? We don't get paid. We don't get paid. Uh, you know, the, the, the people that get paid are the installers and MREA. Uh, MRE, the installers pay MREA, I think, a 10% commission on all the solar that ends up being installed. So again, MREA has a real incentive to promote solar. That's in their financial interest. 
we're not making a dollar on this, but we, but we are uh, committed to doing the right thing for our community. And we hope that we're going to put a lot of dollars in everybody else's pockets with regard to what they're going to save on their energy bills. Okay. We got a couple partners that we have here. Uh, I, again, we've been a bit presumptuous uh, with our hope that you all may be, be a party to that. Um, we're continuing our outreach to the smaller communities that are in our, in our county. Uh, virtually every smaller community is on Alliant Energy and they have the best value return on investment for participants that are gonna engage with this. So we're really hoping we can get those small towns, the Baldwins, the Monmouths, the, the Zwingles of the world, uh, Andrew, um, Sprague,ville all of those, they can benefit the most from this. And that's one reason we want the County Board of Supervisors on our team is that's your domain really. Um, all of these folks that, that are spread across our county. Um, we have uh, got some positive responses from Preston and Springbrook. We're before the Bellevue City Council meeting next, uh, I think in two weeks to see if they're gonna support us formally. Um, we've been talking with them, uh, Makoka Utility. Uh, they're not yet on board, but we hope that they will be. Uh, doesn't look like the city of Makoka is going to be. They wanted the Makoka Utility to be involved. So, um, you know, we're, we're getting some support, a lot of support, but maybe not everybody. Some might see it as being, uh, you know, just not in their economic interests, I guess. And I can understand the city of Makoka might feel that. Um, and regardless of whether or not a community partners in the program, uh, their participant, their, their community members can participate in the group buy. So we don't need Makokota to say, you know, we support the program for a participant from Makokota to put up a solar panel on their roof. Is that, is that even allowed in Makokota? Are you familiar with that? I know their contract with the Wisconsin Power and Electric is pretty strict about anything other than buying it from them. It's allowed, Larry, but they won't pay back. You know how when we when we discussed the the one at the Jackson County Hurstville Center, uh, Alliant has to buy the power back if you overproduce. Mm -hmm. Makoka does it. Okay. But there's there's no you know code or or arrangement that prohibits a person from installing solar within a community that is served you know, buy a public utility or an investor owned utility or anything like that. So uh, a Coconut person could put up a solar array. It would just have to, you know, be properly placed and, and consistent with your zoning ordinances. Okay, you gonna tell us about any negatives here? Well, <laughs> not, not so far. Um, I did wanna, since we are looking at you as a potential partner, I thought we ought to let you at least know what that might mean. Um, and it means, first of all, that you might be willing to help us promote one or two educational events for county participants. Um, you wouldn't really have to do anything other than uh, maybe put it out as an announcement if you wanted to. Um, we'd like to use your logo or your, your name as a, as a sponsor. That's not required, um, but we wanna raise you up in, in terms of recognizing your investment in our community and helping people reduce their energy costs. Um, and uh, if you chose to, you could have someone actually be a member of our program team and meet with us uh, virtually you know, roughly every other week as we go forward. That might be nice just because then you could have someone reporting back to you on a regular basis in terms of the number of installations and who's in, who's in and who's out and all of that. Um, and then finally, oh. there, go ahead. Go ahead, Bruce. I was gonna say, finally, there is another role that a person could play from the county independent of whether you're a partner or not. And that would be to serve on the advisory committee, to help us review RFPs, to help us make the decision of what installer we're gonna go with. Uh, that's a pretty, the advisory committee is a very finite short-term role. It would involve probably about three one-hour meetings. Uh, one, or, one would be to review the RFP, that, the standard RFP that MREA has to see what we wanna change in it. Um, and again, making sure it's representing the county's interests. Um, and then in addition to, uh, to that, when the RFPs come in, we would convene again to review those RFPs and to make the selection for the installer. Um, 
So there's, uh, you know, there's that work that needs to be done, and, and we would welcome a member of, of uh, the Board of Supervisors in, in that regard if, if you have the time and, and the inclination. Um, it's interesting that there is a uh, potential to get recognized as a community with the Soul Smart municipal recognition. So we're hoping that some of the communities that do support this are recognized. And, and uh, you know, essentially it's part of making Jackson County green, and, and I think that is part of our brand as, as a tourist destination. I appreciate it. I guess uh, I myself, I don't see any or a lot of downside to it. I, I guess there's no cost to it. Of course, each entity involved and or participating would have to make their own decisions. So it's not like we're making decisions for Springbrook or Lamont no. or, Ann, or anybody else. So I don't really see a big downside. Does anybody have any questions for Mike or Bruce? Not at this point. I think he's described it pretty well. Mm -hmm. So I guess, uh, you're, what are you looking for us to just- We'd look for you to make a motion to be a sponsor of the, the group by the Jackson County Energy District. You want us to leave our name on the brochure, is that what you want? <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> it's easy and to that ask. Wouldn't, that, it doesn't cost you anything and it doesn't, doesn't bind you in any way, but it would just be that, that we have talked to you guys and you think it's a good deal is what what it really is and then secondly if you would uh try to get somebody that would uh be on that advisory committee which would be a couple meetings here you know but most of the advisory committee stuff is done by september okay well i okay. take a motion to support the jackson county okay. energy district is that what jackson you're saying county energy district. and i would second that and you should put group by in there too. Group by, okay. 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 I would add, first of all, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm not done with that yet there, by the yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> I have a motion and a second to uh, to help have Jackson County Supervisor sponsor uh, the Jackson County Energy District and group by as presented. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Go ahead, Bruce. I wanted just to uh, mention briefly, uh, I actually respond to your earlier comment about uh, the jail, um, because I think we can get you a solar array for free at that jail. Um, it's gonna be, it would be through investors um, who would own the array, but you would gain all the economic value and reduced energy bills associated with it. Um, John and Rick are listening, so we, we'll see what they got to say after a few minutes here. Okay, good. Um, we had a, uh, someone come out to the Hurstville Center to, to propose doing this. The numbers didn't work. It was too small of an array for them to actually invest in. Um, but uh, if we could get something bigger or if Jackson County Jail could be part of the group buy, it would be a perfect storm because then the investor would offer a, would gain a greater return on investment. Uh, I don't know that we can get it done this year, but you know, I just wanted to, to, to throw that out there. Well, yeah, we're already in the middle of June here. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. But these, these group buys happen every year or two. Uh, yeah, okay. well, appreciate year. it. Thank you. And uh, we'll move on from here. And whenever you guys are going to have a meeting, I guess you send us a send us a notice and we'll send a representative. That'd be great. Or we'll try. Yeah. We appreciate you guys. I think you waited for us and we appreciate that too. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thank you. Have a good day. Later. Bye. All right, we are now joined by uh, John Hansen, president of Midwest Construction Consultants. And I see Rick Wiedner's on the line with us also. And he is our architect. Is that the correct title? Yeah, that's what it is. You happy with that? We're happy with it. Okay. Hope some guys are still <laughs> muted, so. There's John. Yes, that, that's correct. Good morning. Good morning. So we're looking for a update, I guess, basically. Uh, I know things have been a little different here the last three or four months for everybody. So I guess uh, we don't know really where we stand um, with, with a September vote yet. If you could just maybe enlighten us a little bit with some updates that you may have and we'll proceed from there. Okay, well, I sent you some information and basically we're starting with the inmate analysis. 
that he asked me to update. Uh, we collected all the data and uh, this first letter that you see uh, dated June 1st, 2020, we did go over in a previous meeting, but I updated this to reflect the current numbers. So currently uh, in 2019, you had 766 total arrests. If you would like to go to the chart behind the letter, uh, we had a total of 766 arrests in 2019. Uh, 199 were uh, 24 hour release, 567 were admitted to jail. 432 of them were male and 135 were female, which represented about, the females represented about 24% of the jail population. So that has been steadily increasing on a, on a yearly basis, as you can see, by about 3% a year. Uh, the average daily population has stayed fairly, uh, at about 11.46 in the past four years. Uh, and the average length of stay has stayed at 11.79. For some reason, the average length of stay decreased to 7.45 days per inmate. And uh, there's no real explanation for that. Uh, I mean, uh, the only thing that uh, I could get out of anybody was that the judges were not uh, admitting as many people to jail. They were providing work release or something, uh, and uh, or they were allowing them to bond out on or release on their own recognizance. The, the thing about the average daily population I want to talk a little bit about is that you also have 41 uh, minimus sentences to be served out there, meaning people that have been sentenced that have not had the opportunity to serve their time. They're required to call in and such, but uh, I think that the sheriff and, uh, and everyone has been cooperative so that we didn't have to ship them out of county. But if those people were to serve them sentences, I think you'd see that average daily population of inmates increase substantially. So I, I just think you need to be aware of that. Also, there's a lot of warrants out there that have not been served uh, for the mere fact of the uh, lack of space in the jail. We'll go out and arrest somebody, then we gotta ship them out somewhere. So the thing about the increase in female population is most of the females are being shipped out of county for lack of space. So, I mean, you have shipped as far as Henry County uh, recently. So, uh, you know, it, it's becoming more and more difficult to find adjacent uh, counties to take the inmates to. <clears throat> so the average length of stay, you know, the average length of stay has increased by 11% 2017 2018 and uh, average daily population has increased by about four percent uh, so and and the second page what we indicated and what you've decided on that we've covered is that we're gonna provide a 30 bed jail uh, and administrative space uh, to accommodate the immediate need uh, with the possibility of expansion. So I guess, are there any questions in, in regards to the inmate analysis and to discuss? No, I would suspect that the numbers are gonna change dramatically with for 2020 with the COVID thing, but uh, yeah, it has probably no bearing on what we're going to do moving forward, you know. Yeah, the thing about the COVID is that right now, if we had somebody in the jail with COVID, I don't know where we'd go with them for the mere fact that, uh, 
You know, we don't have a negative air pressure cell or anything or an isolate place to isolate those individuals. And if they do have COVID, uh, the other counties aren't too anxious to accept them, let me put it that way. So it, it would take some decisions on what you were gonna do with those particular individuals. Maybe people are lesser crimes we would let out, but uh, uh, people that have committed serious crimes, I, I don't believe you just wanna dump on the street, so. Um, I, I know that you're diligently working on other projects also. What do you what do you see the future for material costs per se or and or labor costs, I guess? Well, I wish I had a crystal ball, that's for sure, but uh I would anticipate material costs are not gonna come down. Uh I think that the push is to uh use more American products. We're already seeing where we can't get powder coated products, so we're having to uh, switch product, project, uh, products on uh, current projects. Uh, for instance, uh, the roof hatches, this is a simple one, but the roof hatches were steel and then uh, uh, they were powder coated. Well, the powder coated, powder coating companies have shut down, so we had to switch to an uh, aluminum product uh, milled finish in lieu of that. Uh, so, but uh, I would think that you're, you're going to see some type of price increase depending on when you go. Now, we left the contingency in the estimate for the mere fact that if we, if we decide not to go in September and we go in March, we wouldn't be bidding to August of 2021. Uh, I think that we could probably anticipate that we'd see, you know, some type of uh, cost of living increase or something over that period of time. Uh, I mean, prices could go down. I mean, you, you'd never know. Uh, based on the recession, if, if construction slows down, we may get better pricing then also. I know that's kind of roundabout way, but uh, does that kind of answer but, your question? I mean, I understand that it's hard to predict, and we don't know what's going to happen with you know, either way, you know. Yeah, Rick, do you have any input on that? You're muted, Rick. You're muted. No, hey, I'm Rick. not. Okay. You know, the thing that that I've been watching lately, and it really probably doesn't have to do with anything construction-wise, is have you noticed the oil prices? I mean, they went to. Uh, basically below zero for a gallon of oil and now they're back up there where they were when they started and they're going strong so i guess what i'm, I'm going to say is i don't think we'll see prices like we see now when you bid there'll probably be a good five maybe ten percent increase when you need to anticipate that so that that might be true even if we bid and you know even if we passed it in september we're not going to bid till january so I mean, that could be true of that time period too. It's hard to predict what the market conditions are gonna be at that time, but uh, we always hope that we've left enough contingency and, and, and put the prices to a point that we, we can maintain uh, the estimate, uh, the project estimate. And uh, we may have to make revisions to the plans at yeah. some point in time also. Yep. to adjust to the current market conditions. I think the primary thing would be we need to get the bond referendum passed first. Right. We need to get uh, the ball rolling, so. The next page, uh, uh, I, I did, uh, I redid the annual cost and uh, estimate of, uh, of uh, average daily populations. And in that meeting, that we, that lovely meeting we had with the committee, people were saying that uh, typically counties are experiencing about a 4% increase per year, 4 to 5%. And we had uh, uh, projected that previously. I decreased it based on, uh, at a 2% increase for inmate population. And uh, also projected uh, annual cost. Now that cost that's shown on this page 
is for housing only. So I took the four year average of the loan 0.46 and increased that by 2%. So in a period of 20 years, you're close to 17 inmates, which could be on the low side. So if you're building this jail, you're not, you've been in the current jail since what, 71? You're gonna be in this one for you know, 50 to 75 years. But just in, in 20 years, you, you could double that number or be in the range of 34. The one thing I do wanna point out is that you've had populations as high as 26 already. Now, 26 in a 30-bed jail, you can pretty much consider yourself full. So uh, I, I, I feel that the 30-bed jail is not out of the realm that you need. And I think that we need to plan for that simple future expansion, which we have. And I think that the board's taking that into consideration, and that's why we went up with the uh, walls somewhat and the upper levels for future. And you know that was fifty three thousand dollars. That would have been good money spent at that time. Uh, the one thing, I, if you look at the next uh, the the other page, I, I pulled the Jackson County accounting uh, for two thousand eighteen two thousand nineteen. So you paid boarding costs of $68,243.44. So I took that number and I divided by the number of days on the bottom and could uh, come up and I took the average transportation cost. And uh, so basically the total cost the county would have paid with transportation would have been in the range of uh, $144,380.24. On the right hand side, I took my current estimate off that page we are looking at of 250, 974 and subtracted the days that I calculated on the other side and then multiplied that times $60 a day. And uh, if I took the 250 minus the 182, 730, 60, I matched what you paid in within four cents. So I guess my point is somebody ripped you off for four cents. So, so my figures are, are, are matching what the figures are and I wanted to provide that for some backup for the board so that uh, people understood that these annual housing costs at that jail, this is assuming everybody's going, that the jail's closed and everybody's going, but that $60 a day, those figures wouldn't lie, uh, you know, if you were shipping out 11 inmates. So if you're shipping out 11 and you average 11 inmates out of county on a daily basis, that'd be just your housing cost, that $259.74. So in 20 years, you could spend that $6,846, $6,846,816. So are there any questions regarding that uh, as far as the projections? I mean, that's, that to me would be on the low side and that would appear to be a very reasonable approach. Uh, no, I guess I don't have any I questions. Don't have any questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've also included uh, the revised annual out of county housing transportation costs, which would be two last two pages on that. And uh, basically, uh, <clears throat> we had provided these estimates before. Uh, I provided uh, calculations for two trips, uh, transport to Dubuque County, and then I also uh, provided the cost to transport to Marshall County. I also provided calculation for three trips because the, currently they're running uh, average of three to four trips 
uh, taking inmates back and forth for deposition, court appearances, those type of things. Uh, so I ran it on three trips and then I provided uh, average total trip cost per inmate for two and three trips, meaning I took the average of all four of them and it came up to be $500.90 for those trips per inmate. Now, we know we can't go to Scott. Scott's already full. Uh, so, I mean, we've been going to Dubuque. Currently, you have one female that stabbed somebody down in Henry because they couldn't find spaces. The thing, the thing is that jails do not have to accept your inmates. They want to accept the, the good inmates. They don't have to necessarily take the bad ones. So you do have to search. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> if the jail were closed, it would appear to me you're going to have to have somebody on call all night calling different facilities. I mean, if I arrest somebody and my jail's closed, I got to go book them somewhere but I got to know where I'm going before I go there that they're going to accept that person. So I guess, were there any questions regarding this? So basically if we didn't have the jail, we'd still have to have a facility for booking and for transport purposes either way. Uh, even when you take them to a different jail, you've got to book them into that particular jail. So if your jail are closed, you're going to have to have someone in the office to find a place to take them to that's going to accept that person, whether it be at one o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon. And then that person's going to have to be taken to that facility and booked in. So your time on the road that I've calculated here is going to become more extensive for the mere fact that I have to go in there, I have to wait for the booking personnel, I have to wait for them to physically book them in sign the paperwork, book them in, and then travel back home. I think an important part to remember about this, it looks like it's a break even deal right now, but in 19 years it will be paid for, and we still will have the jail for another 30 some years. And that's what needs to be um, put out there to the people. Uh, I have that document coming up, but it's not a break even. Uh, in 20 years, it, you're, you're going to pay more to ship out of county than you are. But there's a sunset to the jail price. So. Yeah, yeah. 19 years, you'd be paid up. Uh, the second thing I sent you was uh, two. Uh, project budget sheets, we asked about gas and electric. Uh, they're on 1117. And what I did is I talked to uh, Alamakee County is one of the sheets. And Alamakee County, these are the, the bills that they paid for the jail. Uh, they have a jail, the sheriff's administrative, uh, and they also have a water tower shed and a 40 by 64 uh, a metal building for storage of their equipment and things. So I, I took their figure, figures to calculate. Uh, the gas was 15,000, electric 31,173.60 for a total of 46.173. And then I divided it by the total square footage and it came out to about $2.44 a square foot to, to do all those. So, and then I took the, the Jackson County accounting uh, for what we paid in 2018-19. Uh, gas was $1,026.51, the electric of $7,018. 34 and when I divided that by the square footage over there you're actually paying about two six two dollars and sixty three cents a square foot at your existing facility so I guess we've heard that argument out in the public about the cost and uh, I just wanted to make sure that we included that cost 
this is the back, the Al McKee is the backup that will, that people can't argue this is a 44 bed jail, we're looking at 30 bed jail. And so the square footage cost should be accurate and you should have enough information to, to base any argument upon uh, uh, when we do the projections for cost. Are there any questions in regards to that? Well, I can see that the cost per square foot may be less with a newer facility, but you've got much more square footage, so it's still going to be more money. You know, I mean, basically, it's going to cost us more money. But it, but if, uh, if we can operate with the same staff, which we've determined that, I believe. Yes. With a 30-bed facility, I think we were talking 50-bed when we thought we could operate on the same staff. So. Yeah. No, I guess my point, Mike, wasn't that uh, that uh, we weren't going to pay more electric, but that the calculations that were being used to calculate in the final estimate of compare cost comparison was accurate. So it's just some backup for you. Okay. And you know, energy efficiency. I mean, there, there's uh, companies that will come in, like the Bruce was talking about, that will put up the solar panels, and then you just pay the cost of the electricity during that course of that for a 15-year period, and then you own them, or you can sometimes get them uh, at a reduced cost. And that, you know, we've looked at that before. So, <clears throat> have you done any with solar panels? Have not at this point in time. Cedar County has one. Cedar County has a whole field full of them. Yeah, the, they did it after the back, you know, back then when we did Cedar County, you know, <laughs> solar wasn't a consideration. I guess one of the questions is how long are them panels good for? You know, so, but. Well, you know. yeah, I mean, we've got several buildings that we deal with as far as RTA and buildings like that that use them. Um, yeah. We more information, I suppose, yeah. Uh, I also was asked to do uh, the cost for holding inmates in our own facility, and that's the third document you have. So I tried to be thorough about it. Uh, to hold our inmates in our own facility would include food costs and laundry. Uh, uniforms uh, have to be supplied to the inmate. Now, keeping in mind, a uniform that pay forty dollars would would be used multiple times. You know, I, I put the last two year, at least two years, uh, and uh, many times longer than that. So I figured the cost per inmate at two dollars for the uniforms. Uh, the, the employees would remain the same in different scenarios, whether it was the was the sheriff's administration only, sheriff and holding, or sheriff and new facility uh, and jail. Uh, electrical costs we already identified. Uh, and that, that really, you know, we'll have electrical costs whether we are holding inmates out of county or in county. Uh, the men uh, I have attached, the menu's been examined, and to hold our inmates in our own facility, uh, daily average for meals was in the range of nine seventy five. dollars uh, That's three meals per inmate, and that's typical of uh, facilities that we've seen uh, that run around $3 a meal. Uh, and you know, some money could be saved, you know, in buying in bulk also. Uh, uniform, $2. I had laundry because I was, uh, I was uh, anticipating that that would include the soap and stuff, supplies like that. Uh, shampoo and miscellaneous inmate supplies, which was taken off of the team budget and subtracted out was a dollar 46 and then uh, all the miscellaneous jail supplies which included which was taken off the budget sheet uh, Jackson County's budget sheet from 2018 2019 and divided out was about four 
four dollars and sixty nine cents. Now that probably includes some stuff not typically applicable to the inmates, you know. But I want to. I'd rather go to the high side. So the total inmate cost per day were in the range of twenty dollars and forty cents. There's no labor cost figured in there, is there? You have labor whether you're transporting out of county or in county, or, or if you're holding them in your own jail, and that will show up on a final document which does the cost comparison. The labor you're going to have either transporting individuals back and forth or in your own jail, labor will not change. And uh, we've already uh, done the staff analysis and uh, the Delbert, the jail, uh, jail state jail inspector, has approved that, you know, with the staff we have of seven full time and four part time, that we should be able to handle anything in the new jail. But that staff would also have to be running inmates back and forth, making calls to find places for inmates and those sort of things. So I would not calculate that as part of the inmate cost as such. Okay. Pardon? Pardon? What Jack have asked? Why would you not count the labor cost as a, a part of the daily fee for an inmate? It's calculated in the comparison, but it's not an inmate cost because if you don't have that inmate, you're still going to be paying that staff. Well, what do you want me to do, Jack? Well, it just doesn't seem like $20.40 when you have 24 hour um, employees at the jail, sometimes more than one, that there isn't some cost estimate as to what per prisoner cost is to house them. I mean, when they... I guess I see the point to say, yeah, it's gonna cost us to have them two employees there, whether there's two people in there or whether there's 11 people in there, I guess. That's that's the side, yeah, I guess I did. I wasn't. Well, and if you're transporting them out, you're still gonna have them employees, so it's a wash in cost. You're still gonna have, you're still gonna have them 11 staffers on to transport out of county. Uh, the, I guess the bottom line is it's gonna cost you $600 to transport one inmate out of county and it's gonna cost you 20. Now, I, I guess if you want me to add labor and you asked what the cost was to bring the inmate in. So you tell me how you want me to calculate it. Do I calculate one person? Do I calculate two people? You're getting into all these numbers, which, you know, we gotta start coming down to common sense here. Here's a cost to ship them out. Here's the cost to bring them in. Uh, I'll do it any way you want to, but, uh, you know, at some point in time, you're gonna get to a point where, you know, what are you, what are you looking for? I mean, golly. Uh, yeah, we've looked at enough numbers in the last three years to know that, yeah, it's going to cost us either way, whether we, I was in county or out of county, I'd sooner see our. I mean, dollars stay in county. Yeah, we'll see what we can do, I guess. So, I, I mean, this is a fit. I think the figure that they gave him before was 21 or 22. That's the figure I came up with. I guess I, I need a direction on what you want me to add into it because I mean, we, we, I, I've been swimming in dang figures for three months now. And you know what? Uh, I've tried to provide the backup for you and everything else. John, so, can we, John, can we take, You've got the salaries for the jailers, full time and jailers part time. Uh, could we divide that those two numbers by three sixty five and give them a cost of, of you know, staff per day? And am I splitting it up between 
11 inmates that we're holding or am I splitting it up between one inmate that we're holding? Am I splitting uh, it'd, it up? It'd be the same cost between 11 and one, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, but it'd be a higher cost for one individual. This is per individual per day. I, and and I, I think we would just call it per day cost to have staff on, on site. So if they have a number. The numbers are in there. If people want to start taking them and yeah. crunching dang numbers. I mean, huh? the, the. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, 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 don't, I mean, I don't. it's 1522. I called up Becky over there. It's 1522 is the approximate. You got one part timer that's a little bit higher. You're at 2394 an hour for jailers, fringed out. Uh, so if you want to take 2394 plus uh, I think that times eight, don't worry about equals, So that's 191.52 uh, for eight hours for that individual. Uh, John, I think we by 11 or 10. About seventeen dollars, so thirty-seven dollars. Yeah, I can add that to it if that's what you want to do. I can say thirty-seven dollars per day. It's still not sixty dollars a day. So again, I, I we got to come to common sense approach. It's not going to be sixty dollars a day. They'll be, you know, at eight hours, that person can watch one person, and if I dot, divide that by ten or eleven, it's about seventeen dollars. So it'd be thirty-seven eighty-one. If you want me to add that in there, there's three shifts of that eight hours, though. So Becky, okay. we'll get the figures. We'll get the figures from Becky. Deal with them. Don't deal with it anymore. Okay. You got any, anybody have any questions for John or Rick here? Well, I did. Did you get the last one too? I did the estimated cost. We yeah. need to quit buying coffee. That costs more. Too late. I guess. I guess the question is, do we wait till after the general election and have this next March to see? Some people think we should wait to see who the new sheriff is before we move forward on a jail bond referendum. Others with the coronavirus, they think that it's not a good time to have the election in September because people are still battling that. Farming community is really struggling. Good turnout here and on so, Tuesday, so I don't think that's an issue. Huh? We had a great turnout. You're, you'll Tuesday. have the turnout. You <laughs> you won't get to, you won't get what you want, but you're going to have the turnout. But this election. There was not, there wasn't any financial aspects to it. When we moved to the, a bond issue, it's, it's financial. You had 10% show up at the polls on election day, 25% or whatever that figure is. 25% voted absentee and 10% or. I guess, John, I guess so we, we've got to talk this over and decide whether we want to go September or March. But if you just want to throw an opinion in there, you can do that if you like. If you don't like, then you guess you don't need to do that either. That's up to you. I know uh, the I just, uh, I mean, any of the figures, and I, I developed the comparison figures that you can take a look at also, add the wages in. Uh, I, I believe if you're looking at daily costs for the inmates, that I, I wouldn't think that you'd include wages in there because you're going to have the wages either way. But uh, I would say that uh, it, it's entirely up to you with the COVID thing. I don't know how the public's going to react. Uh, I guess the board has to determine how they would go and market it, what they need for marketing from us to get out there and, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, can you, can you get out and hold general meetings? with the public. Has anybody talked to Farm Bureau or anything or? Uh, I did talk to Farm Bureau, yes, this week. And what did they have to say about an opinion on it? Well, it wasn't very positive, I will say that. Mm.
they've We're got some to discuss it and decide what yeah we'll do. discuss i guess and decide you know we'll talk to different people here um that come come into players you know there's several players in this so i guess yeah. what we do is put our put our information together and decide where we go uh you and during them discussions uh you let me know what you need uh if i need to modify any of these documents i'll be glad to modify them and get them over to you you know just finalize them for you we've got the um, plan that you brought last time with the 30 bed with the 12 bed uh expansion pick up possibility and the number for the training room and so on and so forth and we realize that them numbers probably are going to change somewhat so uh that's why you have the contingency in that estimate also though to protect yep. somewhat so. that. okay thank you appreciate your time rick and john and uh yeah, i guess if we got any questions we'll call you personally or as a group and we'll do the best we can sounds great guys yep. just let Good us luck. know and you can call me if you need anything else yep Good yep. Okay, thank you. Hey, John? Yeah. Raining down there in Mount Pleasant or where you at? Donaldson? Yeah, it's raining down here in Huffton. Uh, it's just sprinkling. It wasn't severe, but I heard up north near Manchester that they're getting quite a storm up there. Yeah, they deserve We have it. dark clouds rolling on here, but no rain yet. Okay. Have, have a good day. Okay, Bye. you too. Thank yep. you. Okay, well, again, I guess we're going to have to decide between us, um, speaking to the public and and or other personnel that are ex kin in the game, if we're going to go with the September or a March. There's always that chance that something's going to go wrong over there. So we can't predict that. I understand, and hopefully we, they'll keep working with us as we work forward. So. I guess get your input from your constituents, either in your district or whoever's district you'd like, and bring back some your opinion. We better do it sooner than later if we're going to decide. Anything else before the board this morning? Well, has anybody heard? I mean, the applications are are. Oh, I see. Nick was on earlier, but uh, Stephanie, are you still there? I am still here. Uh, do you know of any applications or where we're at with it? I am going to have Nick comment just a moment. Uh -huh. We've received inquiries, but no applications yet, Mike. Okay. okay. Thank you. Appreciate the update. So if you want to shoot us an email or something, if, you, if we get some or whatever you want to do there, that, that's easy enough. Appreciate it, Steph. I move we adjourn. Second. A motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all and have a great day.